more than a hundred Australians and New Zealanders. We arrived early morning to be surrounded by glaciers and icebergs, and it was just gobsmackingly beautiful. The Antarctic cruise was organised by Australian company Aurora Expeditions. The Greg Mortimer embarked four days after coronavirus was declared a pandemic. Everyone we knew back on planet Earth was, was going into an increasingly meltdown situation. But at that moment, we felt that we were in this great little bubble of purity. The bubble soon burst for the 217 passengers and crew. March 23, three patients with fever. March 24, five patients with fever. While the ship was anchored 20 kilometres offshore from Uruguay, West Australian woman Rose Paget was evacuated and hospitalised in Montevideo. I still look back on that with dread because I can distinctly remember thinking to myself, what the hell do I do in this country where I don't speak a word of Spanish and I get a message from ICU that, sorry, we've done our best, but it it didn't work and she's passed away. Rose was still clinging to life, but not everyone would make it home. 60% of those on board tested positive to coronavirus. What did you think when you got the test results back? Well, we think, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Infection continued to spread on the Greg Mortimer long after passengers were isolated in their rooms. The most likely cause was contaminated surfaces. But passengers were at least able to relax in comfort and got regular updates via announcements over the ship's loudspeaker. Sick crew, like housekeeper Angela Gavilan, were in cramped rooms below deck. Era muy difícil estar ahí adentro porque nunca sabíamos qué pasaba, si era de día o de noche. Esos anuncios no se escuchaban en nuestros cuartos, entonces no sabíamos exactamente lo que estaba pasando. As crew morale sank, Filipino storekeeper Ronnie Lorenzo reached out to his friends in isolation. Era muy querido por toda la tripulación, por todo el mundo, porque él era como, como un papá. Para mí fue una persona, fue una amistad grande en ese momento que yo fui aislada personalmente. Todo el tiempo no sé llamaba, estaba pendiente. Me avisó ese día en la mañana eh, que lo habían aislado. Entonces eh, estaba preocupado. Ronnie's condition soon worsened, worrying his friends and his family at home in the Philippines. Both of the ship's doctors, Colombian Mauricio Usme and Kiwi Jeff Green, were also sick. I wasn't surprised I was positive, but what it did change was that I was now no longer able to go out and see people. I was actually a source of infection. I wasn't a source of help anymore. New doctors from Uruguay had taken over the care of the passengers and crew on the ship. Are you telling your wife, your children, what is happening at this time? In the moment that I was with shortness of breath, it was very difficult. You know why? Because maybe the, the possible complication and die in an intensive care unit, maybe no more opportunities to talk with my family. What's necessary for me, tell them about my situation. My family was uh, very worried. Behind the scenes, Aurora Expeditions and the Australian government had been trying to find a solution. Uruguay agreed to act. We had to do something. These people cannot stay in that boat for longer. There was a huge cooperation between Uruguay and Australian governments. A los pasajeros de esa ciudadanía de Nueva Zelanda. 
This was the news that passengers had been so eager to hear. Uruguay would let them disembark in order to catch a charter flight home. On Good Friday, on the evening, you heard the anchor being pulled up and this amazing moment that we started sailing into Montevideo. So I didn't know what was going to happen and there were stories from other countries in South America where as people pulled in, there were actually protesters, you know, lining the docks. We prepare the buses, we separate the drivers from the people. We were very clear that they couldn't have all the luggage with them because we would not be able to be helping them with the luggage. We were watching the buses all line up and there were an awful lot of ambulances. And I was a bit perplexed, I have to say, as to why. As I look out to my right, I'm, I'm very close to the gangway. A person in a wheelchair in full protective armor looks like a human mummy seated in this wheelchair is there and i thought oh my god what what's going on here what is really happening i didn't work out who it was until we actually got into quarantine in melbourne who was it it was my friend uh, dr mauricio usme ronnie lorenzo and myself we were disembarked first ambulance was for me and second ambulance was for him because Ronnie got inflammation like a pneumonia also. Dr. Usme, who'd led the efforts to protect everyone on board, was hospitalized, along with storekeeper Ronnie Lorenzo. Both were fighting for their lives. Meanwhile, the Australians and New Zealanders were escorted to the airport along a so-called sanitary corridor to prevent the spread of any infection in Uruguay. And then slowly this entire cavalcade, which was about a kilometre long, moved out of the protection of the dock and we started driving through the streets of Montevideo. And then people started saying, they're cheering. And the people of Montevideo were lined up on the streets, waving banners, little children blowing kisses to people they'd never met before. You know, we're sort of like, in the worst possible way, celebrities for all the wrong reasons. But you couldn't help but feel the care, compassion and concern by people we've never met for what we have gone through. I think it touched everybody on the ship. A lot of passengers didn't even know about Uruguay or Montevideo, and when they had said that that's where we were going, people had asked, where is it? Well, now it's on their bucket list of places they want to go to thank these people. When there is a crisis, there shouldn't be frontiers. So I think that Uruguay did what we should do. It's nothing marvelous. It's just what people should do when something like this happens. Just being a good citizen. It's what we, it's what we would like to do if, if we were in the boat. We would like somebody to take care of us. On the plane, it was clear that they'd also set it up as a hospital because there were some people who could have easily gone downhill very quickly. It was the weirdest flight of my life. Touchdown in Australia after a long international ordeal. When we finally landed in Melbourne, there are helicopters hovering over from TV stations and, you know, we'd sort of become a news item. With a fleet of ambulances and buses greeting them, more than a hundred passengers from the Greg Mortimer cruise ship are at last back home. Yeah, felt good to be home. Their fellow passengers had left, but Australians, Rose Paget and Carl Scher, were in the ICU at the British Hospital in Montevideo. Their partners, who'd tested positive for COVID, were also at the hospital in isolation. Rose could have been a million miles away for all the contact I could have with her. I was sort of stuck in this room. I had a lovely window and I could see outside into the gardens and watch the birds. 
You just must have felt so isolated. Oh, totally, yes. Graham was told Rose had been placed in a coma and intubated. Then that her kidneys had failed. And shortly after, that she had a significant gastrointestinal bleed. What was the worst time for you in, in the hospital? I, I find it hard to talk about, but one Sunday morning, the doctor who had come in each day to give me Rose's progress came in and got me to deck up in full PPE and put me in a wheelchair and took me through to ICU. And I thought that was the end. Is that why they took you to see her then, yes. do you think? Yeah, I'm quite sure that um, they felt that I was owed that to be able to see her before I saw her in the in the the, the uh, undertaker's parlour in a box. I. And I couldn't say goodbye because there was a bloody window there and I couldn't touch her. I couldn't. Most of the passengers had gone home. But for the ship's crew, the nightmare was far from over. Remember that the passengers be disembarked April 10, but all the crew members are still on board and nobody told us nothing and no intention for disembark. Yo me sentía mal eh, físicamente, me sentía mal de ánimo, no podía dormir. Angela didn't even know that her friend, Ronnie Lorenzo, had been taken to hospital. De repente, un día no me llamó, pero al siguiente día yo lo llamé y no me contestó. At home in the Philippines, Ronnie's anxious wife, Nana, spoke to her husband in hospital. Saturday na siya tumawag, nasa hospital na siya, meron na siyang ano, meron na siyang mas na ano. Then, tinanggal niya yun para lang makausap kami, makausap niya lahat. Huwag mag-alala, sabi niya, pero sige ko nahihirapan na siya ron eh. After that, hindi na, wala na kaming video call. The intensive care unit, his bed was close to my bed. I can see him from the window and I told him, Ronnie, don't worry, like, uh, you know, everything is gonna be fine. <laughs> Dr. Mauricio Usme got a hero's send-off when he was discharged from hospital. He went straight back to the Greg Mortimer. Ronnie wasn't with him. April 17, <laughs> <laughs> the announcement from the captain by the speakers was maybe 3.30 p.m. Was disaster. <laughs> Nobody told about maybe 30 minutes people was crying. Y fue un golpe muy duro. Fue en ese momento que el capitán lo anunció. Mm, lógicamente para mí fue muy duro porque era un amigo muy cercano y fue muy fuerte. Yo hasta el día de hoy siempre cuando recuerdo esto siempre lloro. Mm. 
52-year-old Ronnie Lorenzo had been on the Greg Mortimer since its maiden voyage last year. Like so many of the crew, his widow always thought their last trip was too risky. In the moment that Ronnie died was the break point. People was very sad. People was disappointed from the company. And also people was feeling that the next people the next person with complication is everyone, you know, you know, to the people was, was feeling that Ronnie today died, but maybe tomorrow I'm gonna die also, you know. Con la muerte de Ronnie se desataron muchos inconformidades, se desataron muchos sentimientos de rabia, Los pasajeros se fueron a sus casas en avión privado y nosotros como cruz seguíamos encerrados, seguíamos infectados y no pasaba nada. Members of the crew also say they were given food that had expired and their access to the internet was restricted. They were now more desperate than ever to get off the ship. But Cruise Management International, a Miami-based company responsible for the crew and the ship's operation, wanted them to sail to the Canary Islands when they were COVID-free. With infection still spreading on board, the crew were fearful of a second ill-fated voyage. Así como Ronnie había muerto, cualquier persona podría empeorarse durante el viaje y podría morir. Nosotros pedíamos que fuéramos repatriados a, a cada uno de nuestros países. Habían muchos compañeros que estaban tratando de hacer como una revolución. Se hablaba de muchas cosas en el barco. Se hablaba de personas que querían quemar el barco. Se hablaba de personas que querían uh, prender las, eh, las señales de alarma, que son las, um, los fuegos, para llamar la atención de, de, de los otros barcos y de la ciudad, los pirotécnicos. ¿Imaginas estar en esa situación, lejos de tu casa, lejos de tu familia, con problemas de comunicación? Bueno... In the end, some of the crew decided to go public with their complaints. Conversamos con Carolina y esta es parte de su testimonio. ¿Cuánto más tenemos que esperar para que tomen acciones? Por favor, sáquenos de acá. People, very clear, they told, we want John from the ship. I'm feeling like that I'm gonna die on board. Eventually, with support from the public and sympathetic trade unions, the crew's prayers were answered. A month after the passengers had gone home, Uruguay agreed to let the crew disembark. Se llegó el día de la despedida del Greg Mortimer, aquí con mi traje de seguridad, listos para partir a un hotel a hacer la cuarentena en el hotel, esperando negativizar para poder irnos a casa. In the moment that we had the confirmation, official confirmation, everyone was very happy. The stress was immediately cooled down. People was happy, calling the families. Everybody was feeling that we are safe, you know? <laughs> we are safe. We are safe because ashore is different than if you are alone in the ocean, you know? With so many international borders closed, it would be many weeks before everyone was finally repatriated. I approached Cruise Management International for comment, but they turned down repeated interview requests. The Greg Mortimer set sail for the Canary Islands with a skeleton crew, where it awaits its next cruise in 2021.
But more than two months after setting off on the holiday of a lifetime, four Australian passengers were still in hospital. Far from home. The last Australian passengers from the Greg Mortimer were still recovering from COVID-19 in Uruguay. Sydney physiotherapist Carl Scher spent three weeks in ICU, but it was another six weeks before he was well enough to return home. Rose Paget eventually stepped back from the brink of death and slowly emerged from her long coma. In total, Graham and Rose spent almost three months in the British hospital. It was a very, very gradual process. When I first was allowed round to see her in her ICU room, I had to gown and glove and mask and everything. And she was basically comatose. If I spoke her name, she could just open her eyes and obviously recognised me uh, with a s bit of a smile. There was a big send-off from ICU. The whole staff gathering around Rose's stretcher, wishing us Godspeed. When her condition had stabilised enough for her to travel, her insurer provided a medically equipped private jet for the journey home. Can you see it? What was it like when you touched down? Totally overwhelming. I remember I could see out of my window Fremantle Port with boats coming in and out. Damn, oh, Daniel! Tell you what, For me, it was uh, emotionally overwhelming. I was able to shed tears on the tarmac of Perth Airport. Hello, Rose. Hi. Hi, Amos. Good to see you. After a six-month ordeal, she's alive and, if not well, then at least improving. Rose is dealing with the long-term effects of COVID-19 and is still piecing together what happened to her in Uruguay. I remember arriving in a little foyer at the front of the hospital, going inside, and I don't remember much after that, to be perfectly honest. And I've had to rely on Graham, my husband, so, so much, because he's my memory card. <laughs> I still sometimes feel as if I'm in a, a dream or a nightmare, you know, sometimes. But um, certainly the worst is behind me, I'm sure. A couple of hours on the cones. A couple of weeks ago, when she was starting her ability to stand up, I was able to give her a hug. And that was overwhelming as well, because this was the first time since we'd been on the boat that I'd been able to give her a hug. And, um, I started crying then too. Several passengers and crew are still dealing with the lingering effects of COVID-19. Rose's doctors don't yet know whether there's been any long-term damage to her kidneys. How do you feel looking back on the decision to go ahead with the cruise? A lot of my colleagues from Denmark were very angry at that decision. I am still grateful for the opportunity, even though it was curtailed. But for Rose, I think she will deserve some compensation. How that will come about, I don't know yet. We haven't decided. Aurora Expeditions has offered passengers a two-thirds refund or a ticket on any other cruise. Some have already signed up for a special trip next year, which will embark from Montevideo. But Anthony Philip doesn't feel ready to face another cruise. You know, I got unhealthy and I left retrospectively very damaged. I felt 
my holiday, my selfish desire as I rationalized it, has now cost a gentleman his life. This is a gentleman in his early 50s with a family. How did this go so horribly wrong? I can only say that they put profits before people. It was a money-making decision. Angela Gavilan says she's also been scarred by her experience. Estoy tomando antidepresivos y medicinas para dormir, pero fue muy fuerte y y más fuerte de pronto perder a a una persona y que fue nuestro compañero es lo más fuerte de esto y que de verdad se hubiera podido evitar si se hubiera pensado un poco más sobre eh, las vidas humanas eh, por encima del dinero entonces es la primera vez que hablo con alguien de esto expeditions told dateline the decision to set sail was made following wide consultation and based on the information available to us at the time our number one priority has always been the health and well-being of our passengers staff and crew Ronnie Lorenzo became a grandfather while he was working on the Greg Mortimer <laughs> Yung apo niya, hindi niya na nakikita. Ang gamit ko lang sila. Maraming pangarap. Maraming pangarap mo. Hindi natupad. Ronnie was the breadwinner for his extended family. He was supporting a brother with leukemia and a son with special needs. But what his family really misses is his kindness. Pag nasa biyay siya, yung... Pag may makita siyang bagay sa'yo, mga bagay-bagay na maganda, si Ronnie, katawagan ka agad na, Ma, may pabango dito, napakabango bagay sa'yo. Sa mga bata, spoiled ako sa kanya. Masukunahin niya pa yung sarili niya kaysa sa amin. Ayun yung mga bagay na nanilis ko sa kanina. Home in Colombia, where the pandemic has killed more than 27,000 people, Dr. Mauricio Uzme is putting his experience on the Greg Mortimer to good use. Hello, Amos. How are you doing, my friend? Working in a hospital ICU for COVID patients in Medellin, Dr. Uzme seems strangely energized by his ordeal. I always tell him to my patient, my friend, I was in the bed like you. I can feel that you are feeling. Don't worry, you're gonna be fine. Un paciente que por la gracia de Dios I'm so está. happy. I'm so happy because God gave me the opportunity to feel in my body, in my mind, in my soul, what's mean to be a patient with COVID. And now I can to pay back, pay back to the life, the opportunity. I'm so happy to work in, in this unit. I'm so happy.